Okay, so we started talking about ADS CFT. Um, I'm really not going to make any like systematic attempt to teach ADS CFT in this course. It'll take a whole other course or two. Um, but I am going to um, use some pieces of it, and so I, I need to uh, tell you the basics. So what I'm going to do today is go through the basics of the ADS CFT correspondence. Um, Let's see. We start just by getting oriented with the geometry. So, anti de Sitter space uh, in d plus one dimensions is the maximally symmetric constant negative curvature. Uh, Manifold, which um, we can think of as being embedded in R d comma two. Um, why? Well, ADS is like a hyperboloid. It's a Lorentzian hyperboloid, um, and so a good way to think about a hyperboloid is by embedding it in one higher dimension. Um, so we think about it as being embedded in. Uh, R d comma two. This is kind of funny because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's got funny signature with two times. Um, but all we all we mean by that is that uh, you take this equation for a hyperboloid in R d comma two, which is x naught squared plus x one squared plus dot 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 plus x d squared minus x d plus 1 squared is equal to minus L squared. Uh, so this is an equation for a hyperboloid in this funny signature space. Um, and it's a hyperboloid of radius L, or radius of curvature L. Um, I don't recommend trying to picture this, because there are two times, and it's going to mess with your head. Okay, so um, it's a hyperboloid, but it's in this funny space. So uh, the advantage of, of thinking about it this way is that you can get to all the coordinate there. So in ADS CFT, people, are, people use all sorts of different coordinate systems all the time, and you need to be able to translate between them and understand, for example, what the isometries are in one coordinate and map them to some other coordinate. And the way to do that is always to go through the embedding space. Okay, so um, because the every every co every coordinate system that you write down is going to um, solve this equation. Um, so the first way we can solve this equation is called global coordinates. And I think if I, if I gave you five minutes to cook it up, this is the one you would come up with. If I told you to solve this equation, global coordinates are the solution you'd come up with in five minutes. It's like the same thing you would do to solve x squared plus y squared equals one. You would set x and y to, to sine theta and cosine theta. Okay, so it's just generalizing that. Um, it's a little more complicated because of the funny signature. So the solution is x naught is L cos rho cos tau, x d plus 1 is L cos rho sine tau, and xi for all the other guys is um, L sinh rho ni, um, where you should think of this ni as a constrained coordinate that lives on a sphere. So uh, that is the sum of the ni squares is equal to 1. Um, so ni is a coordinate on s d minus 1. But it says there's one extra, there's one extra coordinate. Um, because it has this constraint. 
Okay, so this solves that equation, and um, then you can take this solution of that equation and plug it into the flat metric in the embedding space, and you'll find the induced metric on this hyperboloid, and that's the metric of anti sitter So that metric is L squared minus cosh squared rho d tau squared plus d rho squared plus sig squared rho d omega d minus 1 squared. OK, so that's ADS. There's one uh, funny little thing here, which is that um, if you, which is that tau here is a periodic variable. So this hyperboloid that we have in the embedding space um, actually has a periodic time variable. Tau is identified mod 2 pi. Um, but usually when we say the words anti sitter space, we mean we don't mean that. We mean that you unwrap the t direction and just declare that uh, tau runs from minus infinity to infinity. Tau is an angular coordinate, but the circle, the tau circle, does not shrink anywhere. It doesn't shrink to zero anywhere. So there's no problem with unwrapping that circle. Uh, mm -hmm. You just you could just declare it to be unwrapped, and now it's unwrapped, and the manifold is perfectly smooth. Uh, the original embedding manifold had closed time-like curves. The unwrapped one uh, does not, so that's the one that we always really talk about. Um, if all you wanted to do was, was know the metric of global anti sitter space, that would be a perfectly good way to do it. Um, the reason we started the embedding space is um, because it's useful. So, for example, if I asked you what are all the isometries, what are all the killing vectors of this metric, you would have a heck of a time um, figuring that out. Well, it wouldn't be that hard, but it would be pretty annoying. Uh, if I just hand you to this metric. But since, I, since we started with this metric, um, you immediately know the answer. The isometries are just the um, isometries of Rd, 2 that preserve the hyperboloid. Uh, so the rotations and boosts and so on uh, that you write in terms of vector fields on the hyperboloid. And there's some subset of those that preserve the hyperboloid, and those are the isometries of global ADS. Uh, in practice, I, I, I use the embedding space for two things all the time. Um, one is for what I just said, is when I, I need, need some isometries. Um, you know, there's, there's some obvious ones, like, like, the, like the, the tau translation and the rotations on the sphere. But there are a bunch more of them that are not obvious at all from this metric. So that's one reason. Um, the other reason is because um, it's often the easiest way to go between coordinate systems in ADS. So like, I'm not going to, um, actually, I don't know if I'm going to write the other solution, but it's, it's, uh, it's easy to solve this in different ways. And um, then you can just, you get a different solution of the equation. And you can go, you, if you want to go, for example, we're going to have Poincaré coordinates in a minute. If you want to go from global to Poincaré coordinates, Often the, the easiest way to do it is to is to go up to embedding and then back down to the point correct. So this space time solves the Einstein equations with negative cosmological constant. Those is minus one over L squared. And that's a terrible L. L squared. Um, there's a coefficient there which depends on the space time dimension. Um, I'm not going to write. The Penrose diagram is a cylinder. Uh, 
Um, I guess if we were being consistent here, we wouldn't we wouldn't draw that the we would draw this as a we would draw it flat we would flatten it. But everyone always draws it this way, so I'm going to draw it this way. Um, so some things to notice here um, are first of all that it has a time-like conformal boundary. The conformal boundary is infinitely far away. Um, well, let me. So this is the, this is the time direction tau. The conformal boundary is infinitely far away, um, but uh, it's time-like. So if we if we measure the distance from here, it's infinity. Um, however, um, stuff can get there. So like if we if we take a massless particle and uh, we send it toward the boundary, it will, it will go and bounce off. And when it, when it hits the boundary, that, yeah. Sorry, is the Penrose diagram the surface of the cylinder or the solid? The inside. The, the, it's, yeah. it's the inside. Okay. Um, yeah, so the, the, the surface of the cylinder is the conformal boundary. It's kind of like Sky Plus. Um, that's the conformal boundary, but most of it's inside. So um, the I should have drawn the coordinate. So rho there is called a radial coordinate, and that's the radial coordinate on this cylinder. So the conformal boundary is at rho equals infinity. Um, we could we could have derived this in about two lines. I didn't go through it, but we could derive this in a couple lines just by um, doing a, uh, a vial rescaling of that metric. OK, so say you send a photon uh, to infinity. Um, that photon will have, so by the time that photon hits infinity, that's infinite, that's going to be if infinite affine parameter. OK, so the affine parameter is going to go all the way to infinity. Um, but it's going to bounce off and come back. And if you're someone who lives in the middle, if you're someone who lives here, you'll see that photon bounce off the boundary and come back to you in finite proper time. Yeah. What do you mean by bounce? I mean, you send the photon that way, and you wait, and it, it hits you in the face. I guess. <laughs> I guess. How do you see that, like, from looking at the metric, that it's going to do that? How do you see that it's going to bounce off? Yeah. Um, well, like if I were to write down like an ultra yeah. sig, it's it's really a boundary condition. The the way to think of this is as a boundary condition. So, um, I mean, the fact, well, e everything except the bounce point is just solving the geodesic equation. What happens at the bounce point? That's a that's a that's a boundary condition. Okay. Um, but the reason that this is, well, this is a boundary condition that that prevents any energy from leaving into the sitter, so that's the boundary condition that we usually impose. Um, it's also what you would get, like, if you, if you sent a massive particle really fast, it would do this. Okay, so the, the massive particle um, feels a potential well. If we, if we had a, a massive particle that we didn't send very fast, uh, and we solved the geodesic equation, it would feel a potential well that wants to keep it inside ADS. And in, in this picture, so it would just kind of slosh around at the bottom of this potential well. If you send it really fast, it'll try to get close to the boundary, but eventually it'll, it'll get reflected by this barrier. Slightly confusing thing is that ADS is maximally symmetric. I mean, the fact that it's sloshing around, this is not a physical effect. It, it thinks it's going straight, of course, and we could pick a different coordinate system where, where that particle is, is going straight and I'm the one who's sloshing around. Um, but um, that's just the usual, that's just the usual thing. Okay, anything else I want to say about this? Um, well, it's, it's kind of like a box. It's a potential well that uh, keeps stuff in. As I talked about in our discussion of the path integral, it sure would be nice to have a box. Now we have a box. 
The other thing I guess I should say is that in hyperbolic space, like this is, uh, there's lots of space near the boundary. Okay, so the, the distance between here and the boundary is infinite. The distance between here and, and, and here is, is finite. Okay, so there's, a, there's an infinite amount of space in there. So although we squash it all onto the page by, this, by, the, by the conformal mapping, um, there's an enormous amount of space out, out near the boundary here. And you can also see that by looking at the metric. There's that cinch squared rho in front of the uh, sphere factor. Okay, so if we go to large rho, that sphere piece is exponentially large. And that, that sphere, so the, the d omega squared in the, this is the omega d minus one uh, in the metric. So that sphere is getting uh, exponentially large as we go far out. Another favorite coordinate system in uh, Anton de Sitter is called the Poincaré patch. And the Poincaré patch is another way of solving those, that embedding equation. I won't write down the metric. Um, th for looking up this kind of thing, um, there's a, for looking up this kind of stuff about like the different coordinate patches and, and how to translate between them and stuff like that, there's this review. Um, that I think of as the Magoo, but um, let me see if I can remember who the authors are. So Malasena, Aroni, Gubser, Azanoguri. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there's the Magoo review um, where you can you can um, look up the coordinate change to the point where I patch, for example. Um, so this coordinate system looks like this. And uh, the, of course, the, the well, I, I, when I draw a picture of the Poincaré patch, um, I usually think of it as looking like this. Okay, so, so what am I drawing here? Um, this plane here is the conformal boundary. So this is, the conformal boundary in this coordinate system is at z equals zero. That's the boundary. Um, and the nice thing about the Poincaré patch is that slices of constant z have, have, a, have a Poincaré symmetry. But if we fix z, that just looks like a lower dimensional Minkowski space. So it's obviously there's a Poincaré invariance on, on slices of fixed, fixed z. Of course, it's a one dimension lower Poincaré invariance. Um, so the, the slices of constant z go out like this. This is the z direction. Um, and like for example, one of those null rays hitting the boundary that we were talking about is going to look like something like this on this diagram. Um, if we look at the, if we look at z equals zero in this in this metric. So now what I want to do is I want to understand how these, how these two are related to each other. If we look at z equals 0 in this metric, then we have Minkowski space. Right? So at z equals 0, um, it's Minkowski. And the conformal diagram of Minkowski, remember, is a diamond. Um, well, usually we draw it this way. That's the conformal diagram of Minkowski space. Um, but uh, when I drew that cylinder over there, I, was, I, I made it one dimension bigger. Okay, so, so really we should think of, of, I didn't flatten it onto a page, so really we should think of the, of the, the um, diamond as being opened up um, so that we can go both ways. And so the conclusion is that uh, if we want to understand how the Poincaré 
the conclusion is that the boundary of the Poincaré patch is a diamond that lives on this cylinder. Because the, the conformal boundary of Poincaré is a diamond, and we want to think about how that conformal boundary fits into the conformal boundary of the global space time. Okay, so the um, This is the point correct patch. I don't know if that picture makes a whole lot of sense, so let me explain it. I just cut a null plane going this way, and I cut a null plane going that way, and then cut out this sort of wedge-shaped thing, and that's the point correct patch. So how does that match with what I was describing? Well, the, the boundary of this patch is a diamond that's been wrapped around the cylinder. Good. OK. Isometries of this space-time, as I sort of mentioned earlier, but let me write it down. Um, so the isometries are obvious from the embedding space point of view. Right? From, the, from, from either of these metrics, it would be kind of hard to work out the isometries. But our starting point was a hyperboloid in R d comma 2. And uh, therefore, the isometry group is S of d comma 2. And you can very easily write down what those isometries look like just by taking all the killing vectors of uh, the embedding space, you know, stuff like this, which is a boost in the embedding space, um, and restricting to the ones that preserve the hyperboloid, those are your isometries of ADS. And then you would just have to take this and put it through the coordinate transformation uh, to get it into your favorite coordinate system. That's all I have to say about ADS for now. Other questions? Um, yeah. Um, so again, the, the Poincaré patch is like a three-dimensional thing. Yeah. The, oh, sorry. Three-dimensional. It's d. It's d plus one dimensional. In the drawing, I mean three-dimensional. Yeah, yeah. So the d zero is the the one in the boundary, and as d increases, you get like smaller diamonds. That's right. This point is is fixed. You should think of. Uh, let's see. Maybe it would be helpful if I drew an overhead, like bird's eye view. So let's take this slice here and draw a bird's eye view of that slice. Okay, so this is the tau equals zero slice. And uh, the big circle is the true conformal boundary. And now I'm going to draw the Poincaré slicing of this. That's like z equals 0.1. And then you make z a little bigger. Looks like this. Z a little bigger. That is the point correct patch. Yeah, I have one question. Why are we calling the boundary conformal? Did we that, or Sorry, what's the question? Why are we calling the boundary conformal? Ah, um, so the words conformal boundary um, refer to the, just, the, they just refer to the Penrose diagram. So how do we find, let's remember how we find the Penrose diagrams is um, we write ds squared as a conformal factor times something else where uh, this thing has 
is a manifold with boundary. See, the, the, the thing is, anti-descender space doesn't really have a boundary. It's, it's non-compact. It just goes off to infinity. Um, but after you do this rescaling, in order to fit it onto your, onto, onto your page, uh, this rescaled metric has an actual boundary. It's a compact manifold. Um, so the boundary of this thing is called the conformal boundary. It's just, it's just a name. The, in other words, the boundaries that you see in a Penrose diagram, which are not, act, which are infinitely far away, are called conformal boundaries. And that's true for flat space. That's well. true for flat space as well. Yeah, scry plus is a, is a null conformal boundary of of flat space. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, so that's all I have to say about ADS for now. Um, now let me say a few words about CFT. I'm going to have a lot more words to say about CFT, um, but just as sort of a, uh, to get started. Um, so this is a, the definition of a CFT is a quantum field theory with conformal symmetry. Um, the kind of example to have in mind, well, for now, we am going to change this, but an example to have in mind is like a free field, a free massless field. L equals d phi squared, that's a CFT. Uh, that's, a, that's a CFT. It's a free CFT, and the CFTs that are important in ADS CFT correspondence are not free. They're uh, complicated and interacting. So this is an example of a CFT. Um, CFTs are always massless, and we'll come back to that um, in a little bit. For now, let me not try to say in more detail what a, what a CFT is, but I do want to say carefully what the, what, what the conformal group means. What is the conformal group, uh, the definition of the conformal group. So the conformal group is by definition uh, the diffeomorphisms such that um, ds squared of Minkowski space transforms just by a conformal factor. That omega um, can, is allowed to be anything. Now, in practice, you can't get any old you cannot get any old conformal factor by a diffeomorphism. Um, so it, it turns out to, to, to not be anything. But the definition uh, of conformal group allows it to be anything. It just has to be a diffeomorphism um, on Minkowski space. So this is the conformal group of Minkowski space. phrase that in terms of, uh, if we want to make that a little bit more explicit, we could phrase it in terms of the Minkowski metric, eta mu nu, and um, it's the coordinate transformations that satisfy dx prime dx transpose eta dx prime dx is equal to omega squared of x times eight. Now viewing this as a matrix equation, uh, where this is the Jacobian for the coordinate transformation, 
and eight is the matrix. Um, do you want me to go through that to derive this? Does that look sort of familiar? I, I think when I think if in, in a GR class you probably um, consider the case where omega is one, and that's the Poincaré group. Uh, the conformal group just allows it to change by uh, by this factor. As I said, the conformal group of R D comma one is S O D comma two. Sometimes people talk about the Euclidean conformal group. Um, which is the definition is the same except that Obviously, you should replace the eta mu nu by the Euclidean flat metric delta mu nu. And that's going to um, just change this to SO d plus 1 comma 1. So what does this group actually look like? Uh, well, it has three kinds of generators. It has the Poincaré group hiding in there. Uh, so um, all CFTs are relativistic, uh, Lorentz invariant. Uh, it has the uh, dilatation. So the dilatation uh, is the vector field zeta is x mu d mu. In other words, this generates the coordinate, this corresponds to the coordinate transformation where you just rescale, uh, sorry, x to lambda x. The infinitesimal version of x to lambda x is where each coordinate gets uh, shifted by something proportional to itself. So that's this vector field. Um, and finally, it has the special conformal generators. Um, so there are a bunch of these. K mu. So K mu is 2 x mu. Um, x alpha d alpha minus x squared d mu. So there are d of these, one for each. Each, each mu index here is a uh, special conformal generator. A vector field. Um, but the fact that this has an index here tells you that the that the special conformal generators do not commute with uh, the Lorentz subgroup of the conformal group. Um, they have this index and they transform like a vector. Uh, and if you if you look at the commutators of this vector field with with Lorentz, you'll see that it's the usual things you'd expect for a vector. Yeah. That's a good question. Um, yeah, it's not not really. It's that's just the that's just the definition, and we could take, we could add the discrete transformations that, that turn it into O, but it's up to us whether we want our theory to also be invariant under the the, the other components of the group. Okay. 
that's CFT for now. We're gonna do we're gonna do plenty of CFT, but that's CFT for now. I've described for you the symmetry group of the conformal. I've described for you the conformal group, um, and a quantum a conformal field theory is a quantum field theory with this symmetry. Um, and now I'm gonna state the ADS CFT correspondence and some of its salient features. So ADS CFT uses the statement that quantum gravity in asymptotically ADS V plus 1 is exactly equal to conformal field theory in V dimensions. This is a conjecture with a great deal of evidence. Um, the left hand side we refer to as the bulk, the right hand side is the boundary. Note that there's gravity on the left hand side, there's no gravity on the, on the right. Note that the left hand side lives in one higher dimension, hence the word uh, holographic, it's in holographic duality that this is called. Um, I was going to say something else, what was I going to say? Um, ah, so you can, you can roughly, so it's a duality. There's two different, there's two different theories that are equivalent to each other. Okay, so if I, if I draw this, if I draw a picture of ADS, um, you can very roughly speaking sort of think of the CFT as living on the conformal boundary of, of ADS. That's only rough. I mean, the CFT doesn't, we, we have two choices. We either draw a picture of this space time and we fill it in and we put gravity, um, or we draw a picture of its conformal boundary. Uh, that is now a picture of an empty cylinder, uh, but there's a conformal field theory living on this cylinder. So, it, roughly speaking, it, I, I think it's, it's more accurate to say that it lives on a space-time that's isometric to the conformal boundary of ADS. It's not, like, it's not like you would put gravity here and put the CFT on the boundary here. You do one or the other. Yeah. You use the word conjecture. To yeah. what extent do you mean that? What? To what extent do you mean it's a conjecture? Um, well, I mean, it's true, but it's not mathematically proven. And it's not even clear what that would mean, because um, we don't have a complete definition of either side of this equation. We don't know exactly how to define CFTs other than in, other than some two-dimensional examples. And we certainly don't know how to exactly define quantum gravity in ADS. Uh, but to the extent that anything is defined, these two things have been shown to be equal. <laughs> and to the extent that anything is not defined, uh, the I think the right way to think of it is that we should define things in such a way that this is true because uh, it's, it's, um, it works so well. So what does it mean for them to be equal? So equal means that, for example, the Hilbert space in the gravity theory is um, has a natural isomorphism to the Hilbert space of the CFT that preserves all the structure of the theory, like the, act, the, the spectrum of, of the Hamiltonian, the action of all the operators, etc. 
So not only Hilbert space, uh, all, all Hilbert spaces are isomorphic. So it's a stronger statement than that, um, but it's isomorphic in the sense that um, all of the operators map between the theories, including the Hamiltonian. So like the spectrum of energy levels is the same. Everything is the same. The only, really the, the main statement about ADS-CFT that we're going to explore and use in this course is the um, thermodynamics of this duality. So um, at a thermodynamic level, the statement of the duality is that um, if you calculate the CFT partition function at inverse temperature beta, which remember is defined to be trace in the CFT Hilbert space of e to the minus beta H CFT, or by doing a path integral on a cylinder, uh, that the statement of the duality is that this is equal to z grad of beta, the gravitational, so that there's a, a CFT path integral on the left-hand side and a gravitational path integral on the right. Now, as I've been clear, we, we don't have a precise definition of that gravitational path integral, but there are many things that we can calculate. And in particular, we can uh, calculate the semi-classical approximation. This is the thing we were talking about the last lecture, too. This is the sum over saddles, g bar of e to the minus Euclidean on-shell action of g bar times uh, z q of t of g bar. Let me remind you what this means. G bar is the metric of a saddle point, a solution of the equations with the thermal boundary condition. IE here is the Euclidean on shell action, like we calculated for Schwarzschild, but now in asymptotically ADS. And ZQ of T is uh, the quantum corrections to that that you get by uh, taking the quantum, all the fields and the graviton and viewing them as a, expanding them around that saddle point and, and viewing that as a quantum field theory uh, around that background. Yeah? Can we specify what fields there are on the gravity side? Like, how does that correspond to something in the CFT? So the choice of what, that, that's the choice of theory. And um, roughly, sp so this, for, for every field, if you, for every field that you have in the bulk, there's a corresponding set of operate. There's a corresponding operator in the boundary that's dual to that field. That's the rough statement. Um, so if you change the bulk theory, like you add some particles to it or something, then you also change the boundary CFT. It has some additional operators in it. Now, in the bulk, the fields don't have to be massless or anything. Correct but in the boundary they're going to correspond to some massless field? That's right. Yeah. Now it's an open question whether you really can just add fields to quantum gravity. Um, there are, there's many reasons to believe that that's, that most theory, that many theories, possibly even most theories, um, or, or low energy theories, cannot be embedded into quantum gravity, uh, but we don't know. Tom? Yeah. So if we had to prove this correspondence, we have to like uh, define both sides non-perturbatively, right? Yes. And check that they agree with each other. Yes. But what if I, uh, like as of now, we don't have uh, uh, consistent UV completions of quantum gravity theories, right? So what if I claim that CFTs are the UV completion? Then I think that's a totally sensible way to think about it. But then what is there to prove if I say that 
this is my UV completion. Um, well, there are many things you can check between the two sides, but I agree. If you think about it that way, there isn't really anything to prove. Yeah. You have to check that, 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 that no. if you claim that's your UV completion, then all of the stuff that you get, for example, by doing a large N expansion in that theory or whatever, has to agree with, with uh, the gravity theory. So it's, that doesn't make it lack content, but I agree, then there isn't really something to prove exactly. So or it's is, not clear what you're supposed to prove. Uh, so this is not a duality in the same sense as the dualities in quantum field theory. Because well, there, I think there are two theories which are both well defined. I, I don't think so. I mean, I think even, well, this is, I agree this is on a slightly worse footing. So in, in interacting quantum field theory in above two dimensions is not, is not rigorously, rigorously defined. So even quantum field theory dualities above two dimensions are not rigorous statements between two things that are fully defined. Um, now, here it's a bit worse because the, the extent to which we can, it's quite a bit worse because the difficulties in defining quantum gravity are more significant than the difficulties uh, in rigorously defining quantum field theory. Um, but in both cases, they're not mathematical, they're not mathematical theorems. Can we put like, the entire standard model inside the, the bulk? Yes. And we would like know what CFT that corresponds to? Well, it depends what you mean by know what CFT corresponds to. Let me come back, let me come back to that in a couple minutes when I have something to say similar. Remind me if I don't mention it. Other questions? Okay, so I just told you the statement of the duality at the level of the thermal partition function. Now I'm going to write for you the, the more general statement of the duality. Um, we're not really going to use this one very much, if at all, but let me write it down. Uh, the more general statement is that um, Z grav with the boundary condition Uh, that the metric ds squared goes to L squared over Z squared DZ squared plus HIJ of X DXI DXJ um, plus order Z to the D minus 2. So Right, what I'm talking about now is defining the theory. So we have, we first have to define the theory and then we can talk about the space of states and operators and so on. The boundary conditions are part of the definition of the theory. So uh, when we do a gravitational path integral, we do it with some boundary conditions. I'm saying these are our boundary conditions on the metric. Now, if there are also, well, there are also additional fields in addition to the metric. And uh, you also have to impose boundary conditions on those. And um, I'm not going to write the, explicit, the specific boundary condition right now, but uh, it's sort of similar in that um, there's a power of z and then a function of x. x here is the boundary stuff. Uh, I guess I shouldn't just call it, I, I shouldn't call it x vector uh, because it can also have t in it. So let me just call that x. Was that your question? No. Um, what if you have fermions in the bulk? Same deal. Same deal. You can. You have some. The fermions will have some fall off, and then there'll be a um, uh, a function in front of it, which depends on x, um, and plus subleading. Okay. So we impose these boundary conditions. We do quantum gravity with these boundary conditions. Are we constraining the products of the metric or? 
Uh, yeah, let's just order z to the d minus 2. No, are there any constraints on the form? This is, sorry, this is oh, the this constraint is the on the form. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, this is equal to z cft of h i j comma j comma big j. Okay, so on the right hand side, so on the left hand side, these were boundary conditions. H and J were boundary conditions. Uh, on the right hand side, H and J are background fields. What is a background field? It's just like a, it's just something that appears in your quantum field theory that's not dynamical. Uh, the metric being one, so like if we do quantum field theory in curved space, there's a metric in the action. It's not one of the things we integrate over. It's not dynamical because we're not doing gravity. But there's a, it, there's a function in the action, which is the metric. So that's a background field. And uh, in this case, this is the um, fixed. So Hij is the fixed metric in which the CFT lives. And um, J is a source, um, meaning that, well, J uh, stands for all of the other background fields. I'm being sort of schematic about J. But for example, if we're talking about scalar fields, um, then a source, adding a source, means that we take the action um, of the CFT, and we add to it um, the source j coupled to some operator. So this here is a number, and this here is an operator, or in other words, it's something built from the fields. It's something dynamical. And we say that the bulk field phi is dual to the boundary operator Oh. I thought J was an operator. J is not an operator. Um, because J is a fixed number that appears in our definition of the theory. Oh. As opposed to these subleading terms, which are operators. Uh, the subleading terms are operators, but this is a boundary condition. It's a C number. Okay. Yeah, the left hand side is an operator. This thing is an operator. But the boundary condition on an operator is just a number. Yeah. Um, if the CFT has some uh, some anomalies that appear when you turn on the background field, the A and C anomalies, then this should manifest on the gravitational side. Yes. How does that? It's actually built into the Einstein action. When you carefully include the counter terms and the boundary terms, etc., the Einstein action knows about the controllable anomaly, um, and and you can match the two. This, what I have on this board here, is called the Gubser Polyakov Klebanov Witten Dictionary. And it's basically the statement of what we mean when we say that these two quantum theories are dual to each other. They're dual in every way, but this phrases it in terms of, in terms of generating functions, which is a good way of packaging that information. CFT 
uh, must have a large number of degrees of freedom. Uh, why is that? To account for black hole entropy. The entropy of a black hole is uh, enormous. Blank. It's, a, it's a dimensionless number that's gigantic. And we need everything to match. In particular, we need the entropy to match. Uh, so we need the entropy of the CFT to be enormous. So it must have a large number of degrees of freedom. Um, the, we don't get infinite entropy. I mean, aren't there a continuum of states here in the field theory? Yeah, degrees of freedom doesn't mean states. It means like how many, think of, think of that as like how many fields are in the Lagrangian. There's a, it has to be lots of them. So it's different from like Van Neumann entropy? Uh, well, it's thermodynamic entropy. It's a kind of Van Neumann entropy. I think it'll be more clear if I give you an example. So like the, the examples that we know, um, there are examples which are SUN gauge theories, and that N has to be large. It's a large N gauge theory. If you have like a maxly mixed density matrix, isn't the entropy just like counting the number of states? Yeah, but in quantum field theory, you can't make max. This is this is the entropy at a given temperature. You you okay. can't make maximally mixed density density matrices in quantum field theory because the Hilbert space is infinite dimensional. You have to go to infinite. Yeah, so you have to, we're working at a given temperature, the black hole entropy is enormous. So at a given temperature, there have to be an enormous number of accessible okay. states. In, uh, in the examples, in the microscopic examples that I'll get to in a second, N is the rank of some group, and the relationship is that um, N squared goes as L over L Planck, to the d minus 1. L, remember, is the ADS size, the ADS radius of curvature. L blank is L blank. Um, so in other words, uh, in the gravitational theory, we, if we want to have a nice big space time, which is necessary to have a controlled semi-classical description, if we want to have a nice big space time, we, we better have the radius of curvature of the ADS be much bigger than L Planck. And that is measuring the number of degrees of freedom. So it has a large number of degrees of freedom, but um, it's what's called sparse at low energies. Um, let me explain this in words. So if we think about the spectrum, I'll draw a picture. Let's draw a picture. OK, so let's draw the picture of the energy spectrum um, of the CFT on the cylinder. OK, C CFTs, um, CFTs have a continuous spectrum on the plane. But CFTs on a cylinder have a discrete spectrum. And so you can plot, you could just write down, in principle, you can just write down the list of, of energy levels. And uh, what it means for this theory to have a large number of degrees of freedom, but sparse at low energies, is that um, down here, there's just a few states. Uh, those correspond, for example, these correspond to the states that you can um, that you can see in the at low energies in the bulk without making any black holes. So this is the low energy states which have no black holes. You can have like a particle sitting at the middle of ADS. It could be you could have an electron sitting at the middle of ADS. You could have a proton sitting at the middle of ADS or whatever. Those are all included down here. Um, but at some point, you can make black holes. And when you can make black holes, 
there's a transition from the, the sparse part of the spectrum with low entropy um, to an enormous part of it, to an enormous uh, degeneracy of states. So uh, in, in more precisely, there's a region down here where the entropy is order one, and there's a region up here where the entropy uh, is order n squared. Because you want to have um, no, you want to have. So th let's think about that bolt theory. It should be like a reasonable looking quantum field theory in the bulk. Uh, it should not be, for example, a quantum field theory with 10 to the 100 particles, different fields in it. This is not the kind of theory we want in the bulk. We want like a few fields coupled to gravity. Um, that's this sparse piece of the spectrum. But eventually, no matter what, since they're coupled to gravity, eventually you can make black holes, and black holes have enormous entropy. Um, so at some point, it has to tr transition to the uh, order n squared piece of the spectrum. OK, so all holographic CFTs, or all of these AS CFT dual pairs, um, if they have a reasonable semi-classical description, their spectrum looks like this. Now, that's not to say that you can't try a, something crazier, where like, I don't know, you could try to take n small, or you could try to make the spectrum not be sparse. Um, but then you're not talking about a theory that looks like the kinds of black holes that we study in semi-classical gravity. You're talking about maybe some very stringy theory of gravity or some crazy new exotic theory that doesn't have black holes or something like that. You know, maybe you can do that. There are cases in string theory where you definitely can do that. Um, but if you want to have a, a, a theory in the semi-classical regime, then it looks like this. Yeah? Why is there a minimum energy of the black hole? The Planck scale. Okay. Yeah, this is the Planck scale. Okay. Um, Tom? Yeah. Are there interesting states which have uh, energy and entropy of order n? It's like order square root of n. Um, yeah, well, I don't know about order n. I mean, there's a nice, there, there are, there's an intermediate regime here. So let me put it back on that. So these are like light particles down here. And these are like heavy particles, but they're still particles. They're not black holes. Um, and then you get to the black holes. Uh, so it can be useful to keep, it can be useful if we put this at, at n squared. It's often useful to think about the ones at n because um, they're like heavy particles. In particular, um, these things behave as waves traveling through ADS, and these things behave as particles. Like, these things, you have to solve wave equations and stuff to study these, and you just have to solve geodesic equations uh, and see how they bounce around to study these, because these are like particles. Um, that doesn't really require them to go as n, it just really requires them to be much bigger than one. Um, but often people take them to go as n just to, just, I don't know why. So those light particles are like probes in ADS? Uh, uh, you mean these? The ones below. They're both, these are both probes. OK, both yeah. of them are probes. Yeah. Okay.
Yeah, anything, you would need energy of order n squared to back react on the geometry and, and to not be a probe. The next comment is that this is a strong weak duality. This is the wonderful thing about dualities, um, is that um, in some cases, including this one, things that are really hard on one side of the duality are the things that are easiest on the other side of the duality. So like strong is hard. And in this case, there are strong, strong, strongly interacting effects that are basically impossible to calculate in conformal field theory. Um, but when you rephrase them as gravity calculations, they become easy, weak effects. And um, I'll just give you uh, a couple of examples. So, um, for example, if I wanted, if I if I handed you a Lagrangian of a strongly interacting quantum field theory, and I said calculate the entropy density of this quantum field theory at temperature beta, you would have no idea what to do. <laughs> I mean, there's there is literally no way to do that calculation. Even a, there's no there's way to, no way to do it on a computer. There's no way to do it analytically. There's just literally no way to, it, it just can't be done. Uh, I mean, of course, it can be done in principle. If you could solve the theory exactly, uh, you, should, you could just write down the, the list of, of eigenstates of the Hamiltonian and read off the entropy density. Uh, but in practice, it's completely impossible. And there are other similarly basic facts about strong interacting quantum field theories that are just impossible to calculate. Something like the conductivity for example. Uh, there's lots of other things, scattering amplitudes, uh, correlation functions. And all of the things that I just, all of the observables that I just mentioned um, are easy calculations, weak coupled calculations in the ADS CFT correspondence. How do you calculate the entropy density? Well, we just did it. We did it weeks ago. It's area over four. Done. How do, you calculate, how do you calculate the conductivity? Well, one way to calculate conductivity is using the Kubo relations, which say that, that conductivity um, can be extracted from the current-current correlation functions. So all you need, this is not the same J. This is a different J. So if you can calculate these, so these, these current-current correlation functions at finite temperature, finite density, are completely impossible to calculate in an interacting quantum field theory, um, and pretty easy to calculate using, uh, using ADS-CFT. This, this particular calculation, you would throw a photon out of black hole. In other words, you just have to solve the linearized wave equation of the photon field in a black hole background, and you're done. That calculates for you this conductivity. So there's all sorts of of cases like this where you gain enormously by, by going to ADS-CFT. There's a downside, which is that uh, you have to be doing, uh, you have to be studying a CFT with a, that's holographic. You know, not just any, as we've described, holographic CFTs have this funny spectrum with a large gap and then uh, a very dense, uh, very dense entropy above the gap. And uh, that's not a typical thing about, about quantum field theories or conformal field theories. That's something very special. So there's some very, there's some special class, a universality class of conformal field theories uh, which have holographic duals. And within that universality class, you can do, you can do uh, amazing calculations that, that would be impossible otherwise. Uh, but um, you know, if you're studying, I don't know, some material in the lab and you want to know its, its entropy density or you want to calculate its entropy density, well, chances are your material doesn't have a holographic dual, so you're kind of out of luck. You know, we, we, we can still think of this as a toy model for that situation. We can and do think of it as a toy model for that situation. It's nice to at least have one example where we can calculate stuff. You can, there's, no, there's nothing else. There's no other calculations. So it's nice to have one example. 
but it might not be representative of the actual uh, conformal field theory that, that you care about for your physics problem. And this is part of what makes it conjecture. I mean, like these, these things haven't been confirmed to be correct, right? Which things? I mean, th your things that are very difficult to calculate in the CFT side. Is there a way to confirm that what you get from oh. the correspondence? Uh, no, there's no. The, the many things, many of these things don't have another, don't have a second calculation, especially things involving. Well, pretty much anything in ADS CFT that involves no supersymmetry. Um, this is that's a too strong a statement. Many, most of the things that we talk about, if they're not supersymmetric. Uh, there's not two calculations that you can do and match. Most of the cases where we where we can do two calculations and match them are involving stuff that's supersymmetric. It's not quite true. There there are some things that are exactly solvable and not supersymmetric, uh, but it's sort of it's. You know. uh, Tom. Yeah. So in strongly coupled CFTs, we anyway cannot determine the spectrum, right? So, uh, like, how do we determine whether this low energy spectrum is sparse and high energy spectrum is dense? It's hard. We, we don't know necessarily. Um, yeah, we don't know. There, there are there are examples, for example, of three-dimensional CFTs, which might be holographic and might not be. We don't know. You can write down the Lagrangian, and it's an SUN gauge theory, and it's conformal. But we don't we don't know if it's dual to gravity or not because because we don't know how to study it's it's not supersymmetric and we don't know how to compare the spectrum. Yeah. So, I don't know how to answer this, but so I, I would expect that in a strong theory, strong interacting theory, um, things have certain properties like I don't know, they are chaotic or they have weird phase transitions and like interesting properties of strong interacting theory. If those things can be captured by weak theories, I mean, I, I understand we're happy, but doesn't that mean that the strong theory wasn't strong? Actually, it was actually, like if it can be captured by a linearized equation, then it wasn't strong at all. That's a good question. I, I mean, it's, it's, all, it's part, the answer is, is, is yes and no. Um, so it means that there's, it means there's a weakly coupled description. Okay, I mean, it, it means there's a weakly coupled description. I think it probably means that if we had thought about it hard enough, we could have solved the theory without ever saying the words holographic duality by finding that weakly coupled description by some other roundabout way. Um, but the particles really are interacting with each other strongly. Um, so it really does behave like a strongly inter interacting system. And for example, it is chaotic. And you can, you can, use these kinds of calculations where you throw stuff at black holes to show that it's chaotic. The black holes know about the chaos in the, in the strong, in strong interacting field theory. Um, so on the one hand, yes, it means we've taken some kind of simplifying limit of quantum field theories that, that makes them solvable. But on the other hand, it seems to retain lots of the, uh, strong, the truly strong interacting effects that you have in the, in the field theory. It's a bit of a compromise. Yeah. So the statement is not that every CFT has some um, gravity dual. Rather, it's like every ADS theory with these boundary conditions and whatever fields you want to put in it has some CFT that it corresponds to. Um, that's a. That's a. No. Yes. <laughs> yes and no. <laughs> Um, let me let me rephrase some of the comments and try to say them a different way. So um, there's a a thing people often say, which is that um, every CFT has a gravity dual. You can think of the CFT as defining for you a theory of quantum gravity in ADS. That's not really a duality. It's more of just a is is more. Of, it's almost like a definition that that. Every CFT defines a theory of quantum gravity. Now, it might be a crazy theory of quantum gravity where, like, the Planck scale 
is way down here somewhere and, and the string or string scale and, and curvature of the geometry are the same or something. But in some not very meaningful kind of way, every CFT defines for you a theory of quantum gravity and ADS. Um, and then in what sense is that a quantum gravity theory? Like there should be some kind of principles, right? If, uh, well, a certain quantum gravity theory must have. <laughs> yes, I agree. But those principles, so a, a reasonable principle we should impose is that it has a semi-classical limit that's like Einstein plus fields. Okay, but that's not really a statement about a theory. Right? The statement that there's a semi-classical limit is a statement about a family of theories labeled by some parameter that, that as you take the parameter large, like SUN, if I, it's gone. If you take SUN gauge theory of the right top, of the right kind, and you take N large, that it's semi-classical gravity. Now, what if we take that same theory but set N to four? Is that a theory of quantum gravity in ADS? I, I'm not really sure what the rules are. It's like you say, it's it's not a maybe it's some like very strong interacting or very stringy strongly interacting theory of quantum gravity in AAS, depending on how we do the parameters. Um, but it's not very useful in most cases. You know, in some, there are some models where it is useful, because like, if you can, um, say you can write down an exact string theory for that CFT, well, that might actually be useful, even if that string theory is in a regime that doesn't look much like ordinary gravity. More generally, it's not that useful. Um, let me go to the second part of the question, which was whether every theory of quantum gravity in ADS defines a CFT. And I think the answer is yes. The answer is yes, if you have a consistent theory of quantum gravity in ADS. But um, we're not, we don't really, we only know like a couple string theories, a couple examples in string theory. We don't really know how to like go out and, and write down consistent theories of quantum gravity and ADS. Um, so, yeah, I think it's true. Um, but um, often it's safer to think the other way. The conformal field theory is sort of the one we understand better and uh, it's gonna help us, help us understand the bulk. Oh, we're out of time. Okay, we'll stop here. <laughs>